I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to EWTN Live, a program where we bring you guests from all around the world. Our guest tonight is a Catholic evangelist and an author who credits Islam for changing his life and helping to make his Catholic faith real to him. His conversion testimony can be found in his book called How Islam Led Me Back to Christ. Joining us via Skype from not only around the world, but on the other side of the world in Sydney, Australia, where it's early on Thursday morning, please welcome the founding director of Perusia Media, Mr. Charbel Reich. Charbel, good morning. Good morning or good evening, <laughs> Abuna or Father. <laughs> great to be with you today. It is. It's, it's great. So it's 15-hour difference from Sydney yes. to us. Uh, and you are on the other side of the international date line, so it's already Thursday for you. That's right. So we know we're, I'm, I'm, I'm from the future at the moment. So at the moment, it's looking quite, quite bright. So don't have any fear. Uh, we're, we're, we're pretty safe. That's cool. <laughs> That's cool. Well, it's uh, so our audience knows um, way back in 2011, Charbel organized a lecture trip for me to come to the great continent and country of Australia. And it was uh, a lot of fun. We got to see uh, and, and speak in a number of cities and uh, mostly in the Maronite eparchy of Australia, of, in Sydney and in other parts of the country. So it was really a wonderful, wonderful trip. Uh, and Charbel, so folks understand, uh, you, your family is from Lebanon, correct? My, yeah, my mother, my mother was born and raised in Lebanon. Uh, my father was raised in Colombia, South America. Okay, okay. So you have, uh, you know, three different continents going on here. <laughs> yes, that's right. And I'm born in Sydney, Australia. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Uh, so that really is international. But you know. Our topic tonight is, is your book, your conversion book. And you and I had actually talked quite a bit about that process of conversion uh, when I was in Australia. And I, in fact, one of the topics you asked me to discuss was Islam and its relationship to Christianity and things. And it, that had come after your conversion. But so folks understand you uh, come from a Lebanese family who is Christian. That your name is a, a Christian name. Uh, the, uh, one of the greatest saints of Lebanon, uh, very well known around the world and very popular in Latin America and elsewhere and here in this country. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, you know, as you mentioned in your book, uh, you were raised in a, a practicing Catholic home, right? That's right. Yeah. So, uh, as I said, my father was from Colombia, Roman uh, Catholic upbringing. My mother from Lebanon, a Maronite uh, upbringing. But I am a Maronite because my father's grandfather came to Colombia from Lebanon. So, on his dad's side, he is a Maronite. Um, mm -hmm. uh, however, when when we were raised, I'm one of six boys, and we used to pray the Rosary growing up in Arabic, Spanish, and English, and uh, we had the foundations there. My mother. Uh, quite a, a, a traditional, strict uh, Maronite Catholic, and made sure we would would you know, kneel down on our knees, pray the Rosary. Uh, we said a consecration to Our Lady every day. Uh, we would go to Mass in those early years every Sunday, mm -hmm. um, but uh, there was a time when we drifted, and and I think whether or not it was pressures of of work. My dad uh, was working extra long hours. Uh, he did move out of home for a little while there, mm -hmm. and uh, and it was during that time. Uh, we stopped going to mass, and uh, and through the the whole prime we call primary school or elementary school over there, but uh, primary school after my first holy communion, that would be pretty much yeah the last time I'd be on Sunday mass, uh, uh -huh. and uh, I didn't go to Sunday mass after that. We even stopped the rosary for a while, um, and and that's when I went to a, a public school. So I had the foundations early on, but uh, and thank God for those foundations because I did come back to them later, but. Uh, um, we did fall away, uh, unfortunately. 
And all of us. <laughs> I, I, I wanted you to discuss that a bit because, uh, you know, we have this situation fairly commonly. A lot of pressures mm -hmm. come from the culture onto our families. And for a variety of pe reasons, people don't develop their knowledge of the faith in, in sync with the development of other parts of life. You kept going to school, right? That's right. Yeah, you yes. kept, yeah, you went on to the other grades, you went on to high school and so on. You did all your, your academic work, but you didn't let your faith keep up with that. And that knowledge of the faith uh, needs to be kept at, this, uh, at the same level as knowledge of other things in life. That's right, spot on. I, I went to a public high school, a state school, and so there was no religion classes there. And even uh, my, my father, uh, you know, wasn't practicing as well. So there was no real influence, spiritual influence there. My mother had a simple faith. So she understood the faith, but uh, didn't have a way of explaining it, if you like, uh, the reasons yeah. why. We just did it because that's what you do. Uh, and so there was a big gap there. Uh, and so culturally, none of my friends were practicing. I didn't have any Catholic friends growing up. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there was just no no opportunities there to learn and, and the faith. I didn't have any access to it. And, uh, and, and that's, I think I was pretty much uh, there as a target. My Islamic friends saw that and I, I had no response for them. And so, um, yeah. And, uh, well, and we'll get to that in a, in a second. Uh, but uh, I think it's, um, you know, that, that's just another aspect of this. Um, a, yes. There are a lot of Catholics who have what I, call passive knowledge of the, the faith. You know, uh, it, it reminds me of my knowledge of French. I can read and understand what I hear in a movie sometimes, uh, but I can't speak French. And a lot of P Catholics recognize Catholic when it's spoken but they don't know how to speak it themselves. They don't know how to expl put their faith into words. And being able to put it into words is another aspect of having authentic knowledge. You know, I wouldn't call myself a French speaker at all. Uh, I'm not, but I can recognize that's the way Catholics, a lot of Catholics are with their faith, and we all have to take a responsibility to learn how to speak Catholic so that we can understand Catholic as well. That's a great point. Um, as a parent now, I want to make sure I'm, I'm forming our children um, and, and so they don't miss out on what I missed out on in those early years. Sure. Um, and sure. It, just basic terminology, I remember wanting to learn the faith for the first time, I didn't know what transubstantiation was. Even even the idea, I mean, I knew uh, of the box, the tabernacle, but I even didn't know the term. I, I just forgot what it was called. Sure. Um, you know, in sure. cyclicals, what is that? It wasn't across my vocabulary, a papal encyclical. Uh, it didn't make any sense to me. Uh, the councils of the church, all this stuff, I just, it was foreign to me. So how on earth was I going to make sense of of the basics, uh, I just couldn't. Uh, I just knew the Trinity was was a classic. I, I had no idea of it, describing it. It was just Father, Son, Holy Spirit. As you do the sign of the cross, I didn't go any deeper than that. Yeah, and and I had st college students when I was a professor who did not know the Ten Commandments. They just didn't know what they were. Mm -hmm. And when it came to the Sixth Commandment, some of them were surprised that that was a sin. So. Oh, well, yeah, that's where we are. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, exactly. Now, given that background, how did you become uh, at all attracted or interested in Islam? Yeah, thank you. Uh, in my state school, the high school, uh, the majority of the student body were Islamic. I had no Catholic friends, as I said, and, and most of my friends were Muslim. Um, and and they just assumed I was Muslim because of my my appearance. Sure. So I do look like uh, a Muslim to many, um, and a lot of people who are probably not from the Middle East would would think there's no difference between 
uh, Lebanese or Middle Easterns and and Muslims, and and they 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 forget that actually in the Middle East <laughs> there's a lot of Christians too. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so I felt quite alone there in the sense that there was no other Middle Eastern Christian. Um, there was one Armenian friend I had uh, who was Orthodox, um, but then uh, outside of that, they were pretty much Islamic or uh, or other cultures. And and the cultures, it was a melting pot of the world. Uh, if you if you think of my situation, 99% uh, of the student body were from a non-English speaking background. Mm -hmm. So many of them. Uh, wouldn't uh, you know focus in class? We, we got up to a lot of uh, no good, um, uh, and and many of my friends were on the wrong side of the law, some mm -hmm. in and out of jail, and so this was the environment. Actually, I don't think my mum still to this day understands how bad it was. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, she would uh, <laughs> tell me later. I I consecrated you to Our Lady, so you were always protected. So she had that again that that simple trust in in Our Lady. Um, but thank God, uh, you know, nothing major happened to me personally, but but just the circle of friends, the bad influence, uh, um, you know, we didn't take school seriously, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and they began uh, bit by bit asking me questions, realizing, oh, you're not a Muslim. So so you're a Christian. Why are you that? And and from there, they started to ask, why are you wearing that around your neck? And I had a crucifix on and uh, I said, oh, that's my faith. I said, oh, that that's, is Jesus on that cross? I said, yes. Well, he didn't die on the cross. I said, oh, that's news to me. And how do you know he died on the cross? I said, um, but all Christians know that. And he said, well, can you prove it? And I was only 13 at the time, my first year in high school. I didn't know how to respond to that. Sure. Then he said, uh, you know, how could, isn't, if don't you Christians call Jesus God? I said, yes. So did God die on the cross? I, I guess so. <laughs> and he goes, well, okay, well, when God died, does that what happened then? Does that mean the world stopped? I mean, so all these classic questions, which later I discovered would be repeated over and over again uh, through my six years of high school, I would have regular discussions with my Islamic friends. And it was very much around, uh, there's about five or six issues and that they repeat over and over. And, and I, I was uh, well versed with them by the end of high school. And that's why I include them in the book because um, they're very common among Muslims. And, and a lot of them are misconceptions about Christians. Yeah. And uh, uh, well, yeah, so that's how it started. Uh, one of the things I want our audience to understand that in surah, a uh, surah is a chapter uh, or yes. the equivalent of a chapter in the Quran. And in surah four, I believe it's verse 157, it yeah. says they thought that they had crucified uh, Jesus, but they didn't. And you know, based on that verse, um, uh, and, and by the way, the they that he's referring to in the Quran is, are, are the Jewish people. And uh, so then a variety of theories were developed uh, in mm -hmm. the uh, uh, Muslim theology. The most common would be that there was the Shabia, the lookalike, a guy who looked like Jesus was crucified, but it wasn't Jesus. And that's still uh, fairly widely had, though the Quran does not say that. They, uh, the theology, uh, you know, tr tries to explain that verse um, in uh, uh, terms of the, this lookalike dying instead of Jesus. Some even say that it was Judas Iscariot who looked like Jesus that was crucified. So, that's but, right. but that's, that varies. Yes. Um, so uh, let me take a look, uh, just again, to help this, I'd like to give a little quote from your book, which is how Islam led me back to, to Christ. Um, it says, you wrote this, I thank God every day for my Muslim friends, because if it were not for them, I would probably have remained a lukewarm Catholic, living a self-centered, empty life, focused on myself and indifferent to others. This would have ultimately led me to agnosticism, doubting whether or not there really is a God. Um, so when you look back on these 
uh, friends of yours, m Muslim friends, you don't seem to have any resentment. It, it's, you realize how our Lord used them to help you grow in your faith. That's right. Um, and, and it's so true. I, I, I thank them every day. And it was when my best friend at the time, he saw the change in me. He saw that I wasn't a religious person in high school. And then towards the end, when I started to take my faith seriously after the, the day at the mosque and they saw the change, he actually said to me, uh, you know, uh, you you have us to thank because if it was, he, he mentioned it to me, if it wasn't for us, you wouldn't be religious. And I said, you know what? Thank you. You're right. Because if you didn't challenge me, I would not have investigated. So thank you very much. I've, I've got a closer relationship with God than I've ever had. And, and now I have an appreciation for the Catholic Church. And mm -hmm. uh, so, I, and ever since then, I've thanked God every day for it. And, um, and they very much are aware of what I do. Um, they are in support. I've, I've always respected my friends. Um, mm -hmm. I've respected uh, uh, their right to believe what they want. Um, and I think that's what helped build our relationship. I never, I never made it a, um, a personal attack on them. They were born in Islam. I was born in Christianity. But there is one truth, and that's where, where, it's, uh, where we unite, we need to unite. Mm -hmm. Where we, uh, we have differences, we need to discuss it. And in a way where we don't have to bash each other, we just have to share the truth mm -hmm. and we, we can still be friends at the end of it. If we agree or disagree, that shouldn't end our relationship. Um, yeah. and, and so that should, we should be rediscovering uh, this idea of discussions and debate with our friends. And uh, I think we've lost that today. Uh, well, I, uh, I don't know how things are in Australia, but in this country, um, it's nearly impossible to have discussions mm. of uh, not even about religion. Religion is difficult enough, but we can't discuss government, law, policy without people breaking up friendships. Uh, so, and religion, when you discuss it, is even more risky. But I, I think your example here is twofold. Not only do you, have you learned uh, in, in building these friendships that you engage the discussion with Muslims and anybody else with respect for their conscience and respect for their person, but at the same time without denying what you believe and what you know to be true. That's a balance that a lot of people are missing. I think you, you help to do that. The second thing I, I think that you've done is that you don't just let this pass by. A lot of people are engaging agnostics and atheists and just give up don't investigate like you did, and they just sort of give in to the culture. That culture has, our culture has a lot of in dynamic uh, to get people just to, well, don't, don't even talk about it, you know, just give up, forget it. You didn't. And that's one of the no. things I like about this whole process. You took on the issue and studied. Tell us about that. Yeah, it reminds me of that point in the mosque. I've, I, after I gave my life to Allah and Muhammad, I did the Shahada prayer, had the shower, and and what's interesting is when I heard and, that oh, voice. Let me just let me just uh, let, let me just uh, say this too. The Shahada prayer is what? Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, where you say there is only one God and His Prophet Muhammad three times in front of witnesses. Mm -hmm. And if you do that in Arabic, not in English, in Arabic in front of witnesses, then that's a, like a baptism, if you like, an initiation into Islam. That's right. And then typically you would have a shower, wash away, I guess, your old life. It, it, it start this new cleansing. Wear a white gown. I, I had this white gown I was going to put on. And uh, I had this urge to pray in the mosque, in the shower. And the only prayer I knew was what I learned as a little toddler, uh, the Our Father and the Hail Marys. And I repeated them over and over and I, I, it worked out to be a decade of the rosary, so 10 Hail Marys. And when I put on the, the gown, I heard this whisper, not yet. And I, I believe, I, I mean, make it what you will. Was it Our Lady? I'm not sure. But I, I feel that I was addressing Our Lady, so maybe it was her. I took off the, um, 
the gown. I came out, and my the the sheikh there said, "Why? What's wrong? Why aren't you uh, uh, in the white gown?" I said, "Look, I don't know my faith. It's not fair that I leave something I don't know. Let me investigate, study it before I leave it. And if God wants me to be a Muslim, then I will obviously follow that. I just want the truth." He respected that, and that was my stance. And um, nice. and I told my friends again, "Let me study what." what my faith is before I leave it. It's, I don't understand it, so let me get to the bottom of it. And then if God wants me to um, still continue to Islam, then I'll, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and then I investigated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, how did that investigation go for you? Tell us about what you did to investigate the faith. Yeah, can I, I start with the conversion uh, because Having that encounter, if you like, uh, made it real for me. Um, and, and so when, when I got home from the mosque and my mother told me, um, go to the church now uh, and ask uh, Jesus if he wants you to be a Muslim or Christian, um, I did. And I said, I remember kneeling down at the back of the church, looking at the tabernacle and just saying, Lord, I didn't call him Lord then. I just said, Jesus, if you are really there, show me. And and right away, um, uh, I, I just, I, I felt, I this presence um, and for about 30 minutes I was just silent and I was staring at the box and then an elderly lady came in lit a candle and I said what a holy woman but this this realization that according to my discussions only Muslims go to heaven not infidels this lady uh, has to answer three questions when she dies and many people don't realize this but according to Islam when you die you will meet a judge and and you'll be asked three questions who is God that is Allah. So you've got to answer in Arabic. Who is his uh, prophet, Muhammad? And then what's the true religion, Islam? So you have to answer those three. You've got to get three out of three. If it's two out of three, you don't enter into heaven. If you are, And it's interesting. Uh, uh, if you are born a Muslim, uh, you get a second chance. So you'll go to a temporary hellfire, if you like, and then they come back. But if you're not born in Islam, well, then that's your chance. Uh, uh, so it's it's an interesting scenario. When you, this is just among uh, what many of my friends have told me, and now this lady is not going to answer those questions. So right away I had a problem with that, and I thought that can't be right. When I looked at the tabernacle, I saw the shroud of Turin appear, um, and the voice, Charbel, are you going to give up all that I've done for you? I knew that to be the voice of Jesus, and I called him Lord for the first time. I said, No, Lord, I'm not going to give you up. And this big weight came off my shoulders. I could breathe again properly and I, I felt free. I said, I'm a Catholic. I'm going to remain a Catholic and now I need to know why. And out of all the parishes in the country, this particular parish, uh, actually it's one of the parishes you spoke at when you came to Sydney, St. Michael's in Belfield. Mm -hmm. um, it had weekly apologetics classes, Lumen Verum apologetics. Uh -huh. And thanks to people like Dr. Robert Haddad, uh, David Obeid, uh, Arlette Bowen and many of these other young Catholics there, uh, I had a very positive influence, and I would ask questions. Um, how do we explain the doctrine of the Trinity? How do we know that God could be a human? How could Jesus be Son of God and God at the same time? Mm -hmm. How could God die on a cross? Do we have any evidence of the crucifixion, the resurrection? How do we explain that? All these basics, the Trinity, mm -hmm. it's just mind-blowing. And, and uh, thanks be to God, I got my answers bit by bit just by asking. And from there, I, I came across a, a, a priest, a, re a retired priest, Father Chris, who gave me my first ever uh, Scott Hahn cassette. And, uh, and I listened to it, and I was very impressed with his explanation of the Trinity, his conversion story. And that led, one thing led to another, and I kept listening to these cassettes over and over every single day. I couldn't get enough of them. And I would start going, I would continue going to these classes, and I would ask questions. And then I came across EWTN, and I would see yourself on there 20 years ago, uh, Scott Hahn, uh, Lamb Supper, um, and I'd watch all these these shows, and, and I would sit down with uh, my friend, Father Chris, um, and we would study. Uh, we would, would listen to Bible studies, write down notes. He taught me how to pray, <laughs> um, you know, outside of the Our Father and Hail Mary. I learned the divine office, and I learned these other aspects. I just fell in love with my faith, and I wanted to learn more and more. The more I I fell in love with God, the more I wanted to know him. And the more I got to know him, the more I fell in love with him. It was this spiral. So I think it was important that I had that, that relationship was sparked and then the knowledge came and, and I was curious and I wanted to know more. So um, th that's how it started. And, and it got to the point where I was praying 
so much. I was just, I couldn't get enough of, of prayer. People uh, started to ask, uh, uh, do you want to be a priest? Uh, or are you called to be a monk? Because I was in church a lot, three, four hours a day, and um, I couldn't get enough. And the irony is only a year earlier, I couldn't stand sitting in church. <laughs> um, and so um, I just think that's God's grace right there. Yeah, it, it, it's not just some natural thing. It's not just a particular proclivity. And this is, you know, a change from an aversion to this very profound attraction that yes. kept you not just being at church, but integrating the faith and the questions that your Muslim friends had given you, which are good questions. They're important questions. These are not silly issues. These are important questions. And uh, to be able to pursue those and not just have an answer, but the other aspect of having these answers is that you begin to enter into this uh, spiritual reality that our Lord helps you with. Yes, absolutely. You know, uh, when, we, when I was discussing with my Muslim friends the understanding of who God is, Allah, He's the master, He's the all-powerful one. But he's the master and we are the slaves, according to Islam. Yes. Um, but yeah, uh, let the me just Christian uh, understanding, we're, we're family. Yeah, see, that this is one of the big tensions between Muslims and Christians. That yes. in Islam, everybody is Abdullah, a slave of God. Mm -hmm. And right. in Christianity, everybody becomes an adopted child of God. And to us, being the slave seems beneath our dignity, uh, especially since Jesus says, I no longer call you slaves, but my friends. And to Muslims, saying that God is your father is also a blasphemy. They, 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 they cannot accept that. So this is a big breach between Muslims and Christians, is it not? Absolutely. Uh, I remember um, multiple times I was, I was stopped when I mentioned God as Father by my Islamic friends, and they said, it's an insult to God. And yeah. the explanation given to me was, have you got an earthly father? I said, yes. And they said, well, why are you putting on God earthly uh, human attributes? Right. And I said, well, I didn't think of it that way. And so uh, uh, now as a, as a Catholic and now understanding the theology of the church and understanding this idea of fatherhood, it's not that we degrade God when we call him father. It's we, you, yourself being called father, father, and my and myself now, have I got children, I'm called a father. We are imitating in a, in a small way the fatherhood of God. So the reality is God is the real father and we are sharing in a small way that fatherhood. So what an honor for us. It's not that we degrade God, but we get to be lifted up. Um, it's it's a complete opposite understanding of what the yeah. m typical Muslim would think. And yeah. so um, once we understand, these misconceptions can be definitely dealt with uh, one by one. And, and there are a lot of them, but, uh, but, but they're not impossible to explain. I, I think uh, there's a way where we can go through them one by one, and that's consistent. And we can help our Muslim friends as well. Um, deepen their relationship with God. And I think uh, we, we could go a long way if we just understood our own theology a bit better. Mm -hmm. it, that, see, that's, that's an important thing. And the, the idea of calling God our Father is even a stumbling block for many modern people uh, who sometimes, because of feminist ideology, would find that offensive because they see it as limiting God, whereas the, the whole issue was something that Jesus Christ had initiated. It wasn't something that we said, yeah, we'll make sure we maintain patriarchal control by men by calling God our Father, whereas it's in the Old Testament prophets like Isaiah and some others. And then our Lord Jesus especially takes it and makes it more intimate by not just saying Father, 
but Abba, which is closer to the notion of dad, it's a more tender yes. word for father that children would use as a familiar term uh, when you're in the streets of Jerusalem or anywhere in Israel, you have little kids say, Abba, Abba, Abba. You know, they're talking to their dad. You know, this is, you know, this is the kind of tender love that we understand God has for us. And, you know, learning how to explain and share that is um, uh, an important part of our mission. Absolutely. Totally agree. Um, uh, spot on. And, and, and uh, I think uh, an invitation for not only Muslims, Catholics and Jews. Uh, let's go back and rediscover the salvation history of our faith, going back to Genesis, going back to the development of of how God revealed himself. And uh, and we'll, we'll discover quite clearly he's been there. He is a father. We are his children. And he's, he may discipline us in the Old Testament, but uh, he loves us. And, and, and you, you discover that more so once Christ comes on the scene and he's revealing he's one with the father before Abraham was, I am. And, and, and this oneness of God, really the classics, uh, Gospel of John, um, first chapter, that idea in verse 12, chapter 1, verse 12, we are given the power to become children of God. Wow, and what a privilege. Do we understand yeah. what that means? Um, children, yeah. how could, that's, that's, that's yeah. radical. So it's what a blessing uh, to discover exactly. that. And I took for granted all my life until later realizing, wow, many people, especially in Islam, don't think they will ever meet God. I mean, even in Islam, you'll never get to know God. He's unknowing. He was, he's he's going to be eternally unknown. Unknown, yeah. yeah. Even yeah, in unknowable, heaven, yeah. you're not going to see him. So mm -hmm. um, it's like, okay, well, well, what sort of God is that? And and uh, it, we have to realize God wants this relationship with us. And 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 that's interesting. At least there's a couple of discussions I have in the book, how I talk to my Islamic friend about who God is in his nature and, and what was God doing before he even created us? And I think it's a fascinating question because it, it gets to the core of who God is. Yeah, what, tell us about that, because that, that is an interesting part of your approach. What do you say about that issue of, well, who was God before he created anything? I mean, the universe yes. has only been around for about 14 billion years. That's nothing compared to God's eternity. So uh, God's eternally existing before that. Uh, so what do you say to them about uh, God before there was a creation or before human beings existed? Yeah, well, it's a concrete example. Uh, this was a real life story where I sat down with my Islamic friend about this very thing. And, uh, you know, I've had two years now of watching EWTN, learning, uh, um, praying and discovering my faith. And I, I, I simply asked him, uh, you know, uh, Allah uh, is the master. Before he created, who was he master of? We call him Lord. Before he created, who was he Lord over? We call him creator. Before he created, he wasn't really a creator because he hasn't created yet. So who is God in his essence? So, um, And we started by, um, I just wanted to ask a simple question. Are we here? Did we put ourselves here? And it's, No. So why would we be put here? For what reason? Can we give God anything that adds or takes away from him? And he says, no. And I said, so what's our purpose? And, and, and rightly so, he said, we are here to serve God. I said, fantastic. But as a slave, did God need someone to do jobs for him? From all eternity, he was self-sufficient. So why would God bother to create us? There's only one answer to that question, and that's love. Yeah. God wouldn't create us. It, there's no reason for God to create us if he didn't love us. Mm -hmm. um, because we can't give anything back to him that's going to add or take away from him. So it's purely love that we describe God. And, and now when we ask that, when we get to that point, the, the next question is, who was God loving? Because love isn't just loving yourself. That's not love. It's loving another person. And, uh, and so then he, I, I explained the whole doctrine of the Trinity. Person number one loved for all eternity. Person number two, person number two received that love and returns that love. That person's not just going to say thank you and leave it at that but he's going to return that love, and that is a person number three. So we have this one, two, three idea of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yeah. this triune God from all eternity, loving. Mm -hmm. And somehow in eternity, the mystery is uh, he begot children. He sort of, if you like, I mean, whether it's correct to say this, but uh, he consummated that spiritual love 
then we begot children and we are we are the result of that you know mm -hmm. uh, at, at some point in eternity which it blows our mind but we are born in time and we can't comprehend eternity um, but uh, yes at some point in eternity god created and the only reason was out of love and so that's where we got someone he actually said at the end of that he goes look i don't i can't i'm forbidden to ask any more questions on that nature because i will be i don't want to lose my faith and he actually admitted that what where i was going with it was making sense so the the christian understanding of trinity does make sense when when uh logically gone through and you know it's very hard to understand the trinity properly but uh, yeah, yeah but at least he could make sense of that and, uh, sure. and that was fascinating to see yeah look we have to take a little break we'll be back in a couple of minutes and continue this discussion so please stay with us get back to our conversation with Sharbel Reich. But before we do, I want to give a little programming note about this Saturday, May 1st, at noon Eastern Time. EWTN will broadcast a rosary with Pope Francis live from the Gregorian Chapel of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. This rosary kicks off a month of daily rosaries prayed at Catholic shrines around the world for the intention of an end to the coronavirus pandemic, for the resumption of work and social activities. In addition to this May 1st kickoff event, this rosary marathon, EWTN will carry the first rosary marathon event from the shrine in Walsingham, England. We will also be airing or streaming the rosary from some of the other shrines throughout the month of May. So if you want to get more information, go to EWTN.com and join us in praying the rosary live from around the world for an end of this global pandemic. But speaking of around the world, we are speaking with Sharbel Reich, who is presently in the beautiful city of Sydney, Australia, um, where he lives. Now, Charbel, uh, one of the very interesting elements in Islam is the presence of Mary, the mother of Isa, um, throughout the Quran. There's a whole chapter dedicated to her, Surat Maryam, uh, which is chapter 19. And, the, and she's mentioned another time. In fact, she's the only woman mentioned by name in the Quran. Not Muhammad's mother, not uh, any of the wives of the prophets, not Abraham's, Ibrahim, as they would say in Arabic, not Ibrahim's wife. No, but no other woman is mentioned by name. And in fact, the name of Mary is mentioned more often than the name of Muhammad or of Jesus. Tell us a little bit about the role of Mariat Um Isa in the Quran. Yeah, it's a great point. And uh, thank you for asking that. Uh, it is um, important for us to understand um, that Mary uh, is, in, is an important figure in Islam. And many people don't realize, but they do believe in the idea of Mary being a virgin. Yes. And so um, when I had this discussion with my Islamic friend, when they used to tease me in high school about how can God uh, be a father and all that, and how can God have a son? Because they were thinking in, uh, I guess, physical terms, you know, yes. who did God yes. have relation with to have a child? But then when I asked a simple question, I said, how did Mary get pregnant? And uh, my friend said, well, uh, she 
It was God, by God's intervention. I said, can you just understand? So who is then the father of Jesus? He said, he has no father. And I said, okay, well, just explain again, how did Mary get pregnant? And he said in Arabic, Ruhat Allah, mm-hmm. which is the spirit of God. Right. I said, bingo. I said, that's the Holy Spirit. And we believe the same thing. The Holy Spirit entered into Mary. Now he, he sort of denied and said, it's not the Holy Spirit. It's not the Holy I said, well, it's you just said in Arabic, the spirit of God. Therefore, um, that we're talking about the same thing here as far as I'm concerned. The Spirit of God entered into Mary and then she fell pregnant. So who is the father of Jesus? And then he, he's, he started to repeat, no, he's got no father, he's got no father. I said, where there's a mother, there is ultimately a father. And so, yes, that child came from Mary, but that, that child was, was put there by the Spirit of God. Therefore, we should put two and two together that the the father of Jesus is God himself. Um, and, and, and he understood where it was going. He didn't want to admit to it. But it's an interesting point that uh, mm-hmm. Muslims and Christians can agree on this, that, that Jesus may not have an earthly father, um, but he was put there in the womb of Mary by the Spirit of God. We're, we're on the same page. The difference is, obviously, then they won't go the next step to admit that God is the father. Um, but we understand that that is uh, the logical understanding. And then it goes on to, an, um, in, of course, centuries of Christianity, um, the divinity of Christ, the hypostatic union, and, and it right. just gets um, quite interesting there. But uh, he, he got to the point where he understood why um, we, it, is, I, it is okay and logical um, with that um, system of thinking that uh, Jesus, yeah, can be the Son of God, according to that logic. And I think it's... Um... Uh, also worth uh, mentioning, I, I had an encounter with a gentleman who belonged to Hamas. He was from the religious part of Hamas, not political, not terrorist, or anything like that. Uh, he was, uh, but he was very committed to his Muslim faith, and he. Uh, and I think the role of the Blessed Virgin can be a way to help us bridge that because not only does the Quran say that she was a virgin, but they also teach that she was pure, therefore without sin, naqi, uh, just as in Christian theology, Catholic theology. Uh, and she can't sin, therefore. She's not going to be a sinner. So this gentleman said the same kind of thing that your friend said. Um, you know, I'm very much sorry, Jesus. Uh, if, uh, he said to me, sorry, Father, but Jesus is not the Son of God, and he did not die on the cross. The same standard things that you mm-hmm. heard. Mm-hmm. I wasn't ready to try to help him understand the Trinity, so I said to him, who knows you better than anybody in the world? He didn't answer, so I said, it's your mother. She bore you, fed you, nursed you, clothed you, everything. Nobody knows a man like his mother knows him. And I said, the Lady Mary said that Jesus died on the cross. She stood there and watched him. And he said, ah, but Abuna, maybe he is all covered up. She think it is Jesus. And I said to him, no. They took away all the clothes she had made for him. They didn't have Walmart in those days. Moms made clothes for their children. So I said, my question is this. Do I believe the Lady Mary who says she saw Jesus die on the cross or Muhammad who 600 years later says he did not? And I emphasize this is my problem, you know, but I, obviously, I tend to believe the Lady Mary who saw Jesus die. And I think that her witness of Jesus' death is a very important one that uh, has to be addressed. Great point, Father. And it does remind me, uh, that is what many people uh, forget. Uh, In the Quran, that does mention and you said at the start of the show that Jesus was on the cross. It was made to appear so that it was Jesus. And many people 
in Islam would, would describe that Judas replaced him. Uh, my question to my Muslim friends is, why is that in the Quran? Uh, because the context, when you read it before and after, there's no real context of, of that. That verse is put in there, and his understanding is to prove to Christians and Jews that Jesus didn't die. My, my follow-up question is, so why was Jesus on the cross to begin with? Because my Islamic friend, he understood, according to all of his Islamic leaders, told them that Jesus was on the cross, but then replaced by somebody. So, okay, who? Why was he on the cross to begin with? Let's. Uh, there's also another theory out there, uh, and another mm -hmm. friend of mine, uh, uh, a good friend of mine, said, "Well, Jesus didn't die on the cross because three days he was unconscious. So he was on there." And he was unconscious. And three days later, the proof of that is that three days later, he was found walking around on earth. Now, we, we, we right away can think of the Easter story. And that's probably what we understand. He died and rose again. But it's interesting that two theories from two different, uh, both Sunni Muslims uh, would, would describe it that way. And this is what was described to them, that, that a man replaced Jesus or Jesus was unconscious. But my, we haven't passed the first issue. He's on the cross. What did Jesus do wrong to be put on the cross? And that's what I haven't had an answer today for. I'm yeah. still waiting. I don't think there's an answer for that. It, because they also teach that Jesus is naqi, that he is without sin. He's pure. That's right. So he didn't do anything wrong to deserve to be on the cross. And so that's, that's also something very important to understand. And, and again, this is not to be merely argumentative, but these are important issues to yes. understand. And we need to take all of this very seriously uh, to, uh, in order to have uh, uh, an authentic conversation and dialogue with Muslims. Because we do share an awful lot of values and many of the United Nations meetings, Catholics and Muslims have stood side by side to stand up in favor of the life of children in the womb. Islam forbids abortion, as do we. We stand side by side to uphold marriage and family. And we have cooperated with Muslims on many of these issues against secular forces that would destroy the life of children in the womb and would destroy the family. And they and the, the Catholics are very clear on standing side by side on this. But we also have to deal with some of these differences and work through that in our dialogue. Spot on. Um, great, great. Well said. And, uh, you know, many people have asked me, you know, um, I know good, I have good Muslim friends. So how can we say there's anything wrong with, with Islam? Well, we have to distinguish uh, something here. Uh, Muslims are uh, children of God like us. Muslims, they're human beings. They're just believers of Islam. Islam is the, is the ideology that we're dealing with. So we need to learn to separate the two. Uh, we don't have personal attacks on them on any differences. We just point out the differences in the doctrine. And we can even trace back. And I love some of your teachings, too, on this topic. Uh, when you go back and see how it was all developed and put together, you know, the Quran itself was put together over 21 years. And it's just interesting where it got a lot of its information and how it addresses the Injil, the Gospels, how it addresses the Torah, how it, how it does say in many sections, befriend the people of the book. Um, but then there are other sections where, where it's not so friendly. So we have, to, um, we have to point these out and say, okay, let's be consistent. But I'm not judging my Muslim friends. I'm just looking uh, objectively to the ideology of Islam and where it differs. So did Jesus die on the cross? It's a yes or no answer. It's not, it's not he did die, but he didn't die. It, it, it's, it's one or the other. Um, did Jesus claim to be God? Well, he may not have claimed it the way they want him to claim it um, because that's a bit of a, a trap but he's certainly made it super clear crystal clear that he was equal to god the father mm -hmm. um and and that's why he was put on the cross and and so 
um, there are certain areas where we have to sort of put a line in the sand and say, okay, well, this is truth. It can't be both. But I still respect you. You, you, have, you have every right to believe what you want. But let's talk about this. And I know we pray for each other. We pray for a conversion. And we can deepen each other's faith that way. So where we can unite, let's unite. And uh, certainly with atheism, the rise of atheism, Islam is going to play a big role. The rise of the, uh, pro, uh, the culture of death, Islam is going to play a big role with the pro-life movement, with abortion. Mm -hmm. the, the, the definition of marriage, uh, Islam will play a role there with between man, a, a male and a female. And Islam is going to play a key role in, in many areas that we differ with the secular culture. But of course, once we deal with those, uh, let's unite, um, but also one-on-one. -on -one, and I, I, I actually think it's, it's prudent to do it one-on-one, -on -one, not, not name and shame, but do it one-on-one -on -one where, where you can sit down with an Islamic friend and then go through these issues in, with respect. And you get along a lot further because we both want to get to heaven. Uh, yeah. The goal is the same. Um, we both want to meet God. And, and, and so this is the idea. We, we're in this together. It's not a matter of a win-lose situation. I don't, I'm not happy that anyone goes to hell. It's the idea that we are all trying to get to heaven, even our worst enemies. And, uh, and that's the beautiful teaching of Jesus Christ. And when I share that with our Muslim friends, they want to know more. They want to know more about this Jesus because he taught to love your enemies. He taught that um, if you forgive those, you know, you, you will be forgiven. Um, th this understanding of forgiveness is very different. Um, the mercy of God. The Islam have a different understanding of mercy to the Christians. But it, it's important that we all are in this together, uh, in this journey, if you like, towards the heavenly home, this pilgrimage of life. It's very important to, to note that in the earliest passages of the Quran, but, and just so folks understand, the Quran is not organized uh, by uh, themes necessarily. Sometimes there are thematic connections, uh, and it's definitely not organized chronologically. Uh, the the various passages were not written down by Muhammad. Uh, he didn't know how to read or write. It was his disciples who wrote down what they remembered, and as it says, on pieces of wood, pieces of pottery, on shoulder bones of animals that they found, skeletal shoulder bones, they write them down as they remembered them, and that, that then they started organizing, like you said, over 21 years. And in, I think the first verse spoken by Muhammad is not found until Surah 96. But mm -hmm. in these early passages, he makes it clear that God is the creator of everything, and there is no other God. There's no other creator. God is the judge of everyone, and there is no other judge. And he wants, you know, Muhammad, the, the, the purpose of the Quran is to know that you'll be judged, so know what God will judge you on and, and be ready to meet God in that judgment. Well, you won't meet God as such, but you will meet the ju a judgment. Uh, that's very important. You know, we only have a minute and, and a half left. I want to make sure that we let people know that if they want to find out more about your work and ministry, they can go to perusiamedia.com, perusiamedia.com. And I also want to let people know that to find out more of the topics you discussed uh, in your book, your book is called How Islam led me back to Christ. It's by Sharbel Reich. There is also a foreword by my own former student and good friend, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. And this book is available at EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 98437. 98437. Charbel, we're out of time. Thank you so much for being with us all the way from Australia. And may the Lord bless you and all of our audience. 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want you all to know that we can bring Shadwell and all our other programs only because the network is brought to you by you. Keep us between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. Thank you.